We are recording. Okay, let's roll. Welcome everyone to another Dolby Atmos 2024 seminar. I'm your host, Mark A. Gallo, along with Chip Powell, AES Chair of the Philadelphia Chapter. Dolby Atmos 2024 features recording artists, producers, engineers, and industry experts who are deeply immersed in, guess, Dolby Atmos. Through these seminars and with your participation, we hope to elevate the craft of immersive productions. Tonight, we're featuring Grammy-nominated Brad Wood, plus two special guests, Ben Guyvers, Senior Creative Relations Manager at Dolby, and Jeremy Bohm, recording artist, podcaster, and lead singer for Touche Amare. But I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for helping us make these seminars possible. First and foremost, the Audio Engineering Society, created by the industry for the industry. If you currently are not a member, I strongly encourage you to do so. Please visit aes.org to become a member today. Our next sponsor, Odyssey, is an award-winning company designing and building AI-powered solutions for pristine song, sound, excuse me, sound reproduction and immersive spatial audio applications. Their newest headset, Odyssey Maxwell, now offers native head tracking support in the Dolby Atmos renderer for the most accurate preview of your spatial audio work in headphones. Find out more at odyssey.com. So on to our first guest, Ben Guyvers, Senior Cre uh, Creative Relations Manager at Dolby. Ben will now provide you an overview of the intricate Dolby Atmos ecosystem, as well as some of its future developments. Hello, Ben. Hello, Mark. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you to AES, an organization that we work very closely with throughout the year. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, have some slides to present just to kind of illustrate some different pieces of the ecosystem that we get a lot of questions about and then we're doing a lot of work in the community to educate on. So if you could just give me a moment here, I will share my screen and Mark, help me out here to make sure that uh, what we're seeing looks correct. Not a problem. Um, stand by. And of course, it is not working, of course. Just one moment. So. <laughs> All right. Yes, you're good, my friend. All right. So thank you once again uh, for having me here. Um, I wanted to share a bit about the music ecosystem, but I wanted to share that the team I'm on, the Dolby Music Partnerships team, um, we do a lot of work in terms of technical enablement and support of the creative community. So what I'm not going to do today is share creative workflow information and demonstrations with you. We have amazing experts like Brad here that are fantastic at doing that. But uh, what I would like to do is share how kind of all of these pieces fit together. So my team's role is making sure that you've got the tools and the resources to do the amazing work that you do out there. And in many cases, it's about connecting the dots between the content creators and the other pieces of the music ecosystem. So that could be stu um, studios, labels, distributors, uh, services and devices. Um, and all the way throughout that ecosystem, our team, which is led by Christine Thomas, uh, does a lot of work to help make sure that you are able to get where you need to go or want to go. So um, I also host a monthly community session that if you want to check out, go to Adobe's YouTube channel or our pro site, and you can check that out as well. We love to feature mix and mastering engineers, producers and creators from within the community. So I wanted to share a little bit about the ecosystem and how it continues to evolve. And it kind of starts, of course, with the creator, but it's a global end-to-end -end ecosystem. And I think many of your viewers are probably aware of that. Certainly most of the AES members are as well. But in the right-hand column um, is a great illustration of a lot of the progress that's been made over the past couple of years um, in terms of streaming services and 
getting that art out to the two and a half billion devices that are out in the marketplace today enabled for Dolby Atmos. So that's everything, of course, from speakers to mobile devices, soundbars, AVRs, uh, gaming systems, cinemas, live music venues. Yes, you can experience Dolby Atmos music live in venues now as well. And this isn't an exhaustive list. This is sort of just a sample of the partners we work with closely to help deliver the promise of creative intent throughout that ecosystem. But on the right-hand side is is a list of some of the enabled streaming services. And I wanted to illustrate this because it's global. Um, yes, of course, Amazon Music and Tidal were the first two to enable in late 2019. Apple Music, of course, in the summer of 2021. But there are many regional services delivering Dolby Atmos music globally that may be here in the States we aren't always aware of. Uh, services like Angami, Hungama, Neighbors Vibe, which are regional series uh, um, services that are available in the Middle East and in India, QQ Music in China, which is owned by Tencent, and Melon in Korea. So it's a really exciting expansion within the ecosystem for content creators, but also services and devices to be able to uh, engage and, and have a role in this amazing ecosystem. Of course, your viewers and the AES members are very familiar with the tools used to create Dolby Atmos, but I just wanted to highlight that um, just at the end of last year, Avid with 2023.12 now features native Dolby Atmos rendering. Of course, Apple Logic Pro launched in 2021 with that as well, Studio One again last year. And of course, you can use the Dolby Atmos renderer um, to power Ableton Live, for example, or other DAWs that may not have native rendering. Of course, you can use that to use the Dolby Atmos Music Panner independently and the Dolby Atmos um, Album Assembler. So all of those tools, if you're not already using them, um, the Dolby Owned tools are available at Dolby.com, DolbyProfessional.com for um, a 90-day trial. So grab those if you don't have them already. And there are tons of resources out there illustrating how to use those in various ways. Um, wanted to share a bit about the studio footprint, and uh, this is where creators are working globally, and these are not Dolby owned or operated facilities. This is also not a person just with a laptop and headphones somewhere. That's an important way for some people to get started, and it's a great way to do some QC and some work, but these are studios that we know of that meet best practices and have connected with our studio teams, which is a global team, and that also meet best practices. So we have a public list um, on our site of studios that meet best practices and have chosen to be to opt into that listing. It's not all of the studios that are out there. There are some studios that are private that are uh, part of this list that choose not to be listed. But if you have a studio or you know of a studio that would like some help with or guidance with onboarding or integration or be connected to a reseller perhaps in their area, or if you have a creative that's located somewhere that wants to do a QC or needs to be connected to a studio, you can connect with our studios team free of charge. We have a studio onboarding page at professional.dolby.com and dedicated studio teams around the world as well. So the, um, the distribution network is firmly in place, and this is great for independent creators. This is, again, not an exhaustive list of all of the distributors that are enabled, but from the most DIY self-service um, distributors such as Avid Play all the way up to the big ones like the Orchard, ADA, um, TuneCore, chances are your distributor is enabled. They have... The, the pipeline in place to be able to get your music to the services. And if not, if you're connected with the distributor, or you have questions about th their enablement or they'd like to become enabled, we have a dedicated operations team that can help make that happen. So I just wanted to say that, you know, Dolby from its founding is really dedicated to the creative and the independent cre creative community is near and dear to a lot of people on the music partnerships team's heart and uh, and in a wider breadth amongst Dolby as well. So on a major label perspective, and of course this includes indies as well, but a number that we can share that is published and is global, um, last year, 2023 year-end artists, 92% of Billboard's year-end artists were available in Dolby Atmos. So it's across all regions, it's global, it's all labels, all three of the majors, many of their subsidiaries and many independents delivering Dolby Atmos music today. Some stats around the Grammys, 
all record of the year, song of the year, and album of the year nominees for last year, but seven of seven best new artists and album of the year um, available in Dolby Atmos as well. And one of the most exciting ways to experience Dolby Atmos music is in the automobile. Um, we've done a couple of events with AES around uh, the states where we brought automobiles, both our concept cars and in-market cars for attendees and guests to be able to experience Dolby Atmos music in the automobile. It, Lucid was the first to announce with title implementation and the first to actually be on the road as well. Uh, Mercedes-Benz plays back through Apple Music and has Amazon Music implementation in it as well. Um, Neo, Leo, and X, uh, Li Auto and Xpeng are among four, including Yang Wang, Chinese automobile manufacturers that are on the road today. And this number, can, this um, footprint continues to grow. More and more manufacturers are coming on all the time. Uh, if you joined us at CES last year at the Dolby House, we were featuring the new Lotus Elytra with the KEF system in it playing back through Tidal. And one of another very, very cool ways to experience Dolby Atmos is at Dolby Live, which is a 5,200 seat theater in Las Vegas on the Strip, um, featuring a fully integrated Dolby Atmos playback system. So the entire space has been designed, calibrated, and tuned by Dolby's engineers. Uh, Maroon 5 is currently in residency there. They follow Aerosmith and Usher. Um, there have been a couple of other one-off events happening there, but it's a really compelling experiment uh, experience, fully optimized for this live performance space uh, and in Atmos. So if you'd like to opt into our creative database, I'd encourage you to. We feature news, updates, events, tutorials. The Dolby Atmos Music Community Session that I do monthly um, is hosted there as well. The mailing list is hosted there. If you have ideas for that session or you want to get in touch with us, or you have something cool going on out there in the world, a new studio opening, a release that's coming up, a partner that might be interested in doing something with one of our partners if they aren't our, already becoming one of our partners, we would love to hear from you. So I know that was the whirlwind version, but uh, that's a bit about the Dolby Atmos ecosystem. Now, listen, um, Ben, I just want to ask you one question. Um, can you share any future developments, uh, things that are on the horizon? You can be real vague. <laughs> <laughs> I can just say, stay tuned. What I shared with you today is going to be growing tomorrow and the next day. So there are so many exciting ways that that weren't on on this sheet here. You know, Dolby Atmos is natively integrated within gaming systems, both Xbox and PlayStation. Um, there are podcasts now being delivered in Dolby Atmos. Eighty plus OTT services delivering Dolby Atmos. You may have heard that H, you know, what's now called Max is delivering live sports in Atmos and in Vision. So. Um, it just continues to grow. And what excites me the most, quite frankly, is creators using the Dolby Atmos tool set at the beginning or early on in their creative process to maybe create in an immersive environment and, you know, push the boundaries for what's possible there. That to me is the most exciting thing from a creative perspective that we're starting to see happen. That's awesome. Listen, great, great presentation. Thanks for taking the time. Ben, uh, to uh, join in here, and thank you. Throw something out from the chat since it's kind of a hot topic. Okay, one good. The yeah. QR code apparently wasn't working for some people. I wonder if Ben could just paste it in the chat. So Absolutely. Can... Sorry yeah. about that. Yep, we'll do. So if you can take care of that. Okay. All right. Moving on here. And thanks again, Ben. Thank you. And I hope I didn't botch your name too bad. <laughs> Not at all, sir. Thank you. I've heard much worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before I introduce our next guest, let's go over some ground rules. We hold a Q&A discussion after the main presentation. All questions should be entered in the chat room where they'll be monitored. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to them all. Please keep your questions about or related to Dolby Atmos. We will ignore questions that are not relevant. Don't mean to be mean. Finally, if anyone has any questions, suggestions, or comments about Dolby Atmos 2024 or poor old me, please send an email to mark, M-A-R-C, at we, W-E, 
mind, M-I-N-D, thegap.com. Now, I'm excited to introduce our featured guest, Grammy-nominated producer and engineer, Brad Wood, who will be streaming live from his studio in California. Beginning his career as a producer, engineer, and studio owner in Chicago, Brad played a part in the 1990s alternative rock phenomenon, working on debut albums by Liz Farr, Veruca Salt, Sunny Day Real Estate, and Ben Lee. Brad built, uh, excuse me, Brad built his current facility, Seagrass Studio, when he relocated to Los Angeles in the year 2000. During the pandemic, he began his journey into Atmos mixing by designing and installing a 9.1.4 system that powers his productions today. He's produced numerous immersive mixes for recording artists like Liz Farr, Toshe Amore, Soul Asylum, The Killers, Diana Ross and the Supremes, and many others. In this seminar, we'll discuss how Brad's initial reluctance to immersive audio evolved into an enthusiastic stance now. We'll also explore how his methods for successful Dolby Atmos mixing has changed and how his history with analog recording has found new relevance in the immersive era today. Later in Brad's presentation, we'll be joined by Jeremy Baum, recording artist, podcaster, and lead singer for Touche Amore, to discuss his immersive album, Is Survived By, which was produced by Brad. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Grammy-nominated Brad Wood. <laughs> what an intro. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say, like, here's Johnny, you know. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thanks to uh, for Ben for all that information about Dolby and, and, and how it's making all these great inroads into uh, into our world, you know, not just in recording studios, but car audio and live even. Um, and yes, I just for the record, Liz's last name is pronounced fair, not far, just just so you know. I'm really okay. screwing up tonight. That's, that's okay. It's okay. But thanks um, for the wanted, reminder. Yeah, it's all right. Get that out of the way. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, I look forward to uh, letting you all know um, what it is that I've been going through. And um, and I, I think probably we should start, if you don't mind, uh, uh, in 2020, you know, roll back four years. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, uh, uh, sitting on, uh, uh, on my rear end <laughs> doing nothing during quarantine, like most of us were. And, uh, my dear friend, Emily Lazar, who's a mastering engineer with years of experience with Dolby Atmos mixing and mastering. She texted me and said, Hey, wow, we're all sitting around doing nothing. Um, I think you should get smart about Dolby Atmos. You should read up on it. And I responded atmos schmatmos just completely disregarded it you know dismissed her out of hand she got on the phone and called me and and read me the riot act and said no please don't be a cynic you know <laughs> please pay attention to this this is an important thing i've really grown to love it you should hear it and uh and so I promised her that I would spend some time reading up on it and she sent some links to articles which i then ignored mostly you know, it was 2020, March of 2020. I was busy trying to, uh, you know, figure out what, what's going on in the world. And, and Brad, it was, I just want to yeah. interject. Sure. What was your reluctance there? Like, you, you were like, you kind of dis dismissed it. Was it due to the fact you didn't know enough about it or you heard immersive productions before and you thought they were lousy? I can't say that I heard stuff that made me think that it was lousy, but um, I'm a little too young for quad quad was you know kind of had already come and gone by the time i was starting to you know pay attention to hi-fi and making records um but in 2004 i did get a chance to hear a 5.1 presentation um here in los angeles and it didn't it didn't set my hair on fire it, it you know it, it sounded good enough and i was listening to some i think it was elton john i think or uh, elton john and steely dan um and the mixes were fine, but it didn't have 
the wow factor. I wasn't blown away. It just was nice music coming through more speakers. But afterwards, I asked the people who were putting on this little demonstration, you know, who's the end user for this? If I go through the trouble of investing in a surround system, who's going to be the person that, you know, the, the consumer listening and how can they listen? And again, this is 2004. And what the answer I got was, well, there's Blu-ray and there's SACD. And I kind of stopped paying attention after they said that because in 2004, we were in the midst of, well, in, in the midst of the, the decoupling of consumers to physical medium yeah. um we hadn't we had not yet gone into a streaming world but people were getting their music online for sure and i think maybe by then i think the itunes store was around um but uh i just thought uh, right away you've got a really limited uh listenership the and also with my career my discography the majority of the of the people who hire me and the people that listen to those uh, my clients records are not audiophiles in the sense of I've got disposable income that can pay for thousands and thousands of dollars of, uh, you know, a surround system. Sure. I wasn't hearing anything about how we can play this in cars, which is where most of us spend a quality listening time. If we're honest, nothing about headphones, which uh, is a huge component of how people listen, especially now. And of course it was just too soon for streaming. Um, so that was the main reason I wasn't interested. It wasn't really because I didn't like the way it sounded. Hmm. I, I just was unimpressed with um, the ROI, the return on investment. If I'm going to sure. invest as a studio owner in, in this kind of stuff and learn the, you know, the investment of time, but specifically money, what's the return on that? And um, it seemed then to be uh, an audiophile only um, customer base, which is really small. It's just too small yeah. and also not one that hit the target of my usual, you know, clients, uh, uh, mm -hmm. listener base. So, uh, I have been aware of and a fan of, you know, Dolby's products for cinema. And, um, it seemed to make a whole lot of sense for, <laughs> uh, you know, to have a surround sound system in a theater, but, um, this is a totally different era. But I was still thinking under that, uh, under those, mind, uh, uh, under you know, with that mindset when Emily um, called me up and told me to stop being dumb and and get smart. So I did read a couple of articles, and a few weeks later in 2020, she contacted me again, and she said, "Okay, now you know, Friday we're going to have a test. You know, it's like homework time. You know, tell me what you've learned." And I hadn't really learned enough, and I wasn't really taking it seriously. And she yelled at me again because she's a wonderful person who cares about me. And she, that's one of her lang love languages is to yell at me. <laughs> so I got yelled at by Emily a second time. I did a little more work. She put me in touch with Carrie Thomas, who then was still with Dolby. Uh, Carrie also began uh, the process of educating this old head and, and getting me to think more about the concept. But really, to be honest, it wasn't until I heard Dolby at Capitol uh, September of 2020 they made a lot of, uh, they, they pulled a lot of strings and jumped through some hoops and we all wore masks and gloves and whatever. And I sat there in the uh, PMC, you know, uh, installed Atmos room at Capitol mm -hmm. at the tower. And, um, and I heard rocket man by Elton John and all of the talking and badgering and bullying and being, you know, inundated with terms and words, it all just fell away. And all I heard was, really inspiring music and it, like I suddenly got it and the light bulb went off really bright over my head mm -hmm. and before I even got out of the parking lot afterwards I had already called my manager I'd called Emily I was calling friends of mine oh my god <laughs> this mm -hmm. is blowing me away um I almost it was it was a reaction that I hadn't had in a very long time to hearing music come out of speakers and um and that began my journey wow um, you mentioned that um, in our previous conversations, uh, lengthy ones that we all, that we had over the past few months, um, <laughs> that your your methods in Dolby Atmos changed from perhaps that point to the way you kind of hand ha handle Dolby Atmos mixes today. Can you get into that a little bit? The things that changed from 2020 to what you're doing now. 
um, mixing wise in 2024? Happily, yeah. Uh, so in some ways, it's it's kind of gone. I was thinking more about it this morning before um, you know before we had a chance you know to start this seminar. Um, it's actually kind of gone full circle. When I began in 2020, um, Liz Fair and I had just finished her latest album uh, called Soberish, and Emily Lazar had mastered it. And that was part of the reason why she contacted me, because she just finished mastering it. And she's like, this is a really immersive sounding record already. There's all kinds of interesting things going on, layers of musical data. Um, I think it would be really good if you mix it in, in Atmos. And so that became my test subject. And Liz was kind enough to let me go ahead. I mixed the, you know, since I'd engineered, produced and mixed the album, I created the stems, um, uh, which is, you know, not just the multi-tracks, but, you know, like a, a, a stereo guitar stem, which has all the effects going on it, you know, and and I did that with vocals, drums, bass, guitars, etc. But I didn't own a physical system yet. And I didn't have uh, even um, an audio interface in my studio that could handle that. Um, so what I was left with was the software version of the Dolby Atmos renderer and a pair of headphones. And um, and I just wore my Sony headphones and mixed as best I could, sort of imagining where things could be. I could see uh, the representation of where the sounds in the objects, which is what Dolby uses to, to identify, you know, things placed throughout this ecosystem here. Um, but I didn't really get the full understanding of it until I'd finished the entire record and then taken it in uh, early 2021 to PMC speakers um, at Mushroom in LA. And I, I had a, a day's worth of you know studio time there. And Ted White from PMC and I took my hard drive and we took the Pro Tools sessions and, and moved things from the headphone world into the physical world. And I made some changes based on what I was hearing and experiencing uh, but for the most part, I didn't change a whole lot. There's some base management ideas about what was going on with the low end. But my point is, I started that album on headphones, and then it went to speakers. Eventually, was you know finished and you know came out commercially. And in June of 2021, I had my physical system, and I've been working, you know, now with a 914 system, and that's been something that I've mostly been wrestling with trying to figure out how to make things sound great in this you know full physical system and the headphone experience is something different from the the, the speaker yeah. experience it's um it's really hard to replicate in fact one could argue that it's impossible to um because we listen, we have the benefit of these speakers reacting in a room and our bodies are, are picking it up. It's not just our ears, but our skin is also reacting and the hair on our arms and body. Sure. You know, there's a lot that that headphones or earbuds have to, uh, AirPod Pros have to uh, compensate for. And they can't really. I mean, it, it, it's a lot of math going into that. But my point is, I went then from an era of 2021 until about a year ago where I was really focusing only on on the physical speaker system. And in the meantime, Apple is taking a portion of the uh, Dolby uh, you know, Atmos packet of, of, me of metadata, and they're adding their own proprietary zhuzh. I think that's the technical term. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for AirPod Pros and AirPod Maxes, you now listening through Apple Music, you get the spatial audio Atmos experience with head tracking and all that. And that really, came on strong in 2022. But what I'm finding now is that I really enjoy using these and listening to my mixes um, and AirPod Pros with 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 Atmos spa Apple Spatial. And mm -hmm. and I am it's getting better all the time. They're making improvements incrementally, sometimes what I can perceive as big leaps, but I'm mixing two headphones again, you know, like, like it's, it's kind of come full circle from 2020 and, to now. You know, I did a, a, a mix exclusively on headphones. Um, and then I checked my mix at a, in a 7.2.4 monitor setup. 
And mm -hmm. the number one problem in my mix is I, the instruments that I placed in the rear, I mixed too loud. Because when mm -hmm. I was wearing the, wearing the headphones, I wasn't here, it wasn't loud enough. You know, it was like a localization issue. So I, I, you know, just then I would get them in the headphones where they work. But when I played it in a monitoring system, um, it was like, yeah, those guitars are like way too loud in the back. And I had right, to drop right. it down by like 3 dB. And Michael Romanowski, who we did a seminar with, mm -hmm. he said, that's a common problem. Did you experience that when you tested your, your um, original mix <laughs> that you did? Was that yes. one of the issue? It was. Uh, yeah, again, that's also where my uh, my mixing in Atmos procedures and techniques um, has evolved. Uh, where I place things and and um, and where I set uh, my binaural settings has has changed. I got lucky enough to uh, uh, you know to have the benefit of Carrie Thomas's knowledge and Christine uh, uh, Thomas also really helpful um and also emily um uh these are people who are saying hey you know you got to pay attention to your binaural settings a, a, a lot of this stuff uh when it comes to dolby atmos it seems you know obvious that it's come uh you know from the film and tv world where this is just one component of a of a potentially huge mix where you're 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 bringing in elements of of dialogue and and location sound you've got music you've got uh sound effects and uh a lot of the terminology has been borrowed you know or just you know just ad adopted you know this the atmos for music initiative um you know isn't as old as uh atmos for cinema and uh uh so there's things that as a non I'm not a film and TV guy. I don't know the terminology. Uh, I get uh, I get intimidated when there's too many instances, and when I'm looking at too many, uh, you know, screens with SMPTE time code on it. It's like I get thrown, I get thrown up by that stuff all the time. And um, uh, so the terminology and the ways to make best make use of these uh, Atmos uh, uh, concepts that was something I had to learn. I think it's something that anybody who doesn't have a background in film and TV mixing has to learn. Um, and, uh, and so I think I made a lot of rookie mistakes, which is to place, um, is to place really crucial sounds sometimes in the wrong speakers. Um, and what and, are and some of those crucial sounds? <laughs> right. Well, vocals? that uh, you have voc <laughs> vocals. Okay. Well, uh, well, let's, let's get into it. Because you know, there's that there's whole a, argument of like, you know, phantom center type of thing or, like, hundred percent there okay so let's just like break it down at least from you know i'm, I'm only going to speak for myself um but the idea that you are sitting where i'm sitting and i'm facing my speakers my left right that's the stage essentially mm -hmm. and the idea that when i'm sitting here mixing a band that i've recorded uh, say a rock band with two guitars drums and vocals and bass um maybe the first guitarist or the you know the he's going to be over here on the left we'll call him angus young okay so he's <laughs> over here <laughs> and his brother uh or, or malcolm uh you know so you know angus is, is is coming out of the right speaker malcolm's going to be coming out of the left speakers because that's where the guys in acdc have historically stood you know malcolm always was parked on to the right of the drummer uh near the drum riser and that's oftentimes how i've mixed records that i've produced right uh stage left stage right center for vocalists because that's almost always where the vocalist stands drums mm -hmm. kind of coming up the center and then you, you and you pan out your uh you know your overheads and cymbals as if the drummer had 40 foot arms and a wingspan like this and you know but you know we we play with the imagery of what is uh your sound stage all the time and um Film and TV is a totally different thing. It's much more immersive in 3D because you're using picture as well. And actually everything serves what's going on on screen. So um, I admit to having a fairly limited concept of where to place things once I was getting out of the stereo field. Mm -hmm. And my reluctance to move something essential like a rhythm guitar too far in the back ended up serving me really well. So meaning that if I, you know, I wasn't going to take 
the only real rhythm guitar and put it all the way in my rears. That felt too far out of my comfort zone as far as like what I traditionally experience when I'm an audience member watching a band play on a stage. Having said that, I've also been in bands and I've been the bass player off to the left of the drummer's riser. I could have mixed things from the band's perspective. Mm -hmm. And there are people who do do that, but that's something that unless it's my own music or I've got the explicit uh, okay or approval of, of the artist to do so, I don't take those kinds of liberties usually. My bass tends to come up the center, bass instrument, whether it's a synthesizer or a guitar. Um, and it tends to live in the stereo, like the LCR, um, with some exceptions, and I rarely move it too far away. So rhythm guitars don't really go much past my wide left and you right. You like it in the front? Uh, Sides. <laughs> There's a joke there. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna even go. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I, well, here's the thing. And <laughs> my, but my mixing philosophy has evolved. And it really is program dependent. So um, <laughs> electronic music, where you're talking about drum machines and synthesizers that don't have an acoustic sort of you know life, they are always coming out of a speaker in order to be heard. Well, you can kind of place those anywhere, you know? Uh, but I work with mostly you know, electrified guitars, acoustic drums, voices being sung, not generated electronically, and and a lot of that for me is tethered to the traditional audience perspective, you know, yeah. mixed stage, but I am evolving and I am getting more adventurous and that's with trial and error. And also to be honest, listening to Apple music, you know, and my time in between sessions to other people's mixing there, you know, people are getting really creative and aggressive about mixing things um, and placing things differently and panning techniques. I, I don't think that I'm necessarily a Luddite, but I think initially my mix is translated and, and succeeded maybe where others might not have because I've got such a strong sense of audience perspective. I'm an old head. I've been around for decades. I've been doing this a long time. So um, I, you know, uh, some of those uh, structures or, you know, some of that constriction has actually worked to my benefit. But now I can see where there's other elements to play with. And I've always done that. So you've got like a, a guitar solo or a synthesizer, you know, blast or, you know, something that goes, you know, which is more of a cinematic sort of symbol rise right. thing that, you yeah. know, it comes from behind you, rushes forward you or bang in the front and then dissipates, you know, back away from you. Movement's really exciting. And I like, I like to, you know, have that motion and movement, but, um, but I don't do that usually with like the meat and potatoes of a traditional rock band. Now, with the vocals, just circling back just briefly, your sure. tendency is to put the main vocalist right in the center? No. <laughs> I mean, left, right, oftentimes in objects, pull just a little bit off the face, you know, into the sides a little bit. But I also will have an aux center feed, and I will feed the center uh, speaker. And, mm -hmm. and that is part of getting things to sound good, not only uh, immersive, but also to have it sound good in um, Apple spatial. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that center channel is life. That is the secret weapon for getting translation to currently to, uh, to, to I think to, to AirPod Pros in, in Max's. And with drums, you tend to spread them out more. And by the way, on that note, you're using the drums, the different drum tracks as objects, correct? Not always. Again, it's really program dependent. Oftentimes I'm presented with uh, stereo mix ready stems and the drums will all be on a stereo stem. Kick, wow. snare, you know, uh, in fact- but That really limits you. That really it limits you. Yeah, it does. Fun. But there's some creative stuff you can do. I have um, I, I, I learned this from uh, accidentally from Ryan Ulyate, Um when I listened to uh, You Don't Know How It Feels, um, the, his Atmos mix of that. The drum reverb is coming out of the rears. And mm -hmm. I found that to be so. So appealing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I loved it, uh, whether it's a room mic or a verb, but he was putting reverbs in the rears. 
And I found that to be immersive enough. And also, uh, it just it sounded perfect for that. Um, so I have my I have my own Pro Tools, you know, Atmos mix templates that I import uh, my audio stems into. And it involves, you know, a half a dozen different reverbs placed already pre-selected around here. Some are purely stereo. I've got a couple that are just mono. I've got some that are 5.1. I've got now 712 um, instances. And and I often will use all of them in, in a mix. Add just a little bit for here or there. Um, and um, it, that's what I'm doing with drums. I do center aux send. I do a center. I do an LFE aux send. You know, to the to the LFE, heavily filtered as per requested by UMG and yeah. Apple. Yeah. It makes sense. You know, you don't want to send full bandwidth. You know, information to your uh, to your LFE because um, you don't really know what your LFE is going to be in any given consumer system. Let's make it simple for the LFE. Wherever that subwoofer is, somewhere in the world, let's not screw it up for them. And sometimes, um, you know, and sometimes not all music needs an LFE. Most of the stuff I mix, I don't include the LFE, um, yeah. but I don't, but I don't use the LFE fader that's provided in the multi pan or in Pro Tools ever or any third party software. I just, it's, I, I always send via my own created LFE. Aux. Interesting. You know, because when we did the seminar with Ryan Olye, his immersive album that he released, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Act Three, um, we were fortunate enough, we were doing the seminar at an Atmos studio, and he gave us the ADMs, and we, you know, yeah. played it through the renderer, and I got to tell you, man, he was pumping that LFA. I mean, <laughs> pumping. I mean, it was, you know, what do they say? Don't go over minus 18. It was, it was obviously... Oh. Like, Half of that, but still half yeah. of that is a lot, you know. I, and, and it worked. It it still worked. I mean, it was it fit. It fit. I I I use a fair amount of LFE, but I don't put it on everything. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's on it's on drums. It's on bass guitar. Any bass bassy you know information. If there's something up in the in the heights, I tend to you know let's leave the LFA out of that. Uh, uh, I know that you know a lot of people's physical systems are full full bandwidth, full, you know, full frequency speakers. I still tend to treat the overheads um, as extra. And I don't usually put critical information in there with some exceptions. And some of that is because I get worried about translation. If you're playing, um, you know, if you're playing back on a Sonos uh, Arc uh, soundbar, you know, the, they're just, it's just shooting up a uh, sound yeah. hopefully up above you and you, you know, depending on the room that you're in and have you specifically tuned that bar to that room, you may just lose everything that's going on up there or car audio. I know the Volvo just announced that uh, the EX30, which comes out later this year, will have a Harman Kardon sound bar with I think 11 or nine speakers in it and will be immersive, including Atmos, yeah. which I'm really excited about. But I don't know how to that... buy that car. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, I know. I, know. I, I put a deposit down on it, and I told them over and over again in their little seminars, their surveys, we better have Atmos. We better have Atmos. You know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy that they they obviously, you know, buckled to my pressure campaign, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Volvo. But I don't know how I don't know how the overheads are going to translate as beamed up into the yeah. interior of that car. I don't know. So. Sometimes I put really critical information, meaning that like, you know, a mix that we all know, um, like uh, Diana Ross's I'm Coming Out. There's a trombone solo that everyone knows when you hear it. You're like, oh, my God. Yes. The only trombone solo on a number one single probably ever in, in the history of the world. Um, I put it up in the heights. That's a risk. It's a calculated risk because I don't know exactly how the heights are going to be represented or even if they're going to be represented, depending on how it's played back of course if it's played back because of dolby's uh you know software if it's played back on headphones or on a stereo speaker it's going to be represented fine as long as i've mixed it correctly but in a system like say for instance is this unheard yet uh volvo soundbar mm -hmm. i don't know if the way you know they're gonna dolby's you know that Amos is probably gonna say oh this is a 
soundbar system. And, you know, it's, it's really up to whether Vol Volvo's tuned it correctly. Whether that information, I'll let you know when, <laughs> when I get the car. And the first <laughs> thing I'm going to do is I'm going to play that song and see if it's still there. And if it's not, I'm going to lobby that I go back and remix the song and, and, and revise it. I shouldn't really say that. But, yeah, you know, this is a new technology that is entirely dependent on the consumer's playback system. It, yeah, scales, to, it, sc it scales up or down to whatever they've got. And the more complicated the playback system is, the more reliant it is to the room that it's in and whether it's been tuned correctly and maintained. And from people I spoke to who've done, for instance, whether it be a 9.1.4 uh, mix or a 7.1.4, whatever, is that they found a lot of issues folding down from that format to a stereo file. That is, you know, going from 7.1.4 as an example to 5.1 is workable. But a lot of the decisions that engineers make in a 7.1.4 format, or in your case, a 9.1.4 format, and what I'm talking about is decisions like dynamics, EQ, is that mm. when they, it gets folded down, it kind of gets squashed. You know, do, do you find that to be the same experience that you've had where you find yourself? okay, man, I did my 9.1.4 mix. Now I got to do a stereo version. And now I kind of have to tweak things a bit to make it fit in a stereo. So in a word to answer you, no. Wow. Um, uh, I think it's because I started on headphones. <laughs> I think, I really think that's it. And Carrie, Thomas said, uh, you know, I would recommend that everyone start on headphones. And if it sounds good on headphones, then take them off and listen to your fancy system. I don't do that anymore. I do, I do always monitor headphones, but I don't until later on later, you know, later stages of mixing. Um, in the, in the, so when we talk about fold down, we're basically saying stepping down from a full on big system to, yeah, you know, the Dolby renderer where older, hey, yeah, works its way it down. down and you, I want a stereo mix. And so you can monitor the physical, the like you said, the 712, the 5.1, the 5.0, yeah. the 2.0. And that's really, if, if the 2.0, the stereo <laughs> fold down in my system sounds really close or identical, essentially, to the stereo reference that I'm always referring to, well, then you're good. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I play with my uh, you know binaural settings, which is off near mid and far and um i play with those a lot although I, I i've developed a system like we all do if you do it often enough you will get a feel for all these things it's really a steep learning curve or was for me and it took me a long time to get comfortable playing with these uh terms and these uh specs this technology has a lot of pitfalls um and you have to really pay close attention but the last thing i do before i, I finish a mix um is i check my 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 metering i'm looking at levels because those are very very strict and specific and i don't mess with them at all i really don't um and then i and then i i tweak my binaural settings and i i get rid of unused objects if i'm not using all of the objects available to me i get rid of them i don't want the render printing empty space that'll get rejected by the streaming services or Any by the race issues folding down from that you know, nine point one. I mean, do you, do not you, really, <laughs> not you, really. No, I guess it I depends mean, it, on the music, really, in the mix. Yeah. It really. I, mean, I, I have had good luck with, um, with my Atmos journey, and I think a lot of it has to do with a couple of things. And one is, I didn't skimp on on building it and designing it, and that's where I got to thank a company like PMC, who have been really deep into Atmos. Um, you know, about as early as you can for commercial stuff. They're a really high quality company. I, I've i never skimped on my monitoring choices, you know, speaker monitors, um, and I never will. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I want to know what it sounds like on the, on the worst or lowest cost uh, system. I also want to know what it sounds like on the, on the most expensive system I can afford that I like. 
and that has been that way since I started in, in my first studio in 1988. I'm, I know I, I don't change horses uh, mid battle very often. So I went from Genelex in 1996 to PMCs in 2021. That's a long run with one brand of speaker. Sure. Um, and I didn't choose Genelex uh, for a variety of reasons. One is which is that I haven't really liked their current generation of of speaker design for years. So I never really seriously considered them. Didn't have a relationship with them, and that's fine. I've purchased many, many thousands of dollars worth of Genelex systems, and they're a great company. But we're really only talking about what do you like? As, yeah, well, it's as, what as you do. I mean, absolutely. It really, that's what yeah. it's about. I think there's no wrong speaker system, but there are ones that can. Uh, maybe be pleasing to you, but might not be giving you a good representation of what you're hearing. So face coherence is really important with, uh, you know, with Atmos. I mean, it's, it's critical. It's everything. And um, well, there's so much uh, space involved where you can place things that when you fold it down to a start, even a 5.1, you could go, oh, that kind of sounds weird now. You know, you can run yeah. into this problem because you're squeezing the heights down to a surround thing. In you know, in addition to the surround objects or beds, whatever right. you're using, right. and and you, you dangerous. So having a so having really good equipment for your physical system is you know the best that you can afford. That's critical, but even more so would be to make sure that your room is appropriate for what the task is. And you know, we have to remember that instead of just a stereo set of speakers, two sets of speakers blasting your face and entering your room and engaging your room now you've got potentially 14 of these things all pointing at your head all interacting with the various surfaces and and you know mm. and reflective you know surfaces in your room your room becomes a, a much larger participant in your um, in your process and if you've got a room that is problematic for stereo it's going to be a pain in your ass pardon my french for Atmos, like, oh, uh, you know, so, so being comfortable with your, you know, having a space that has been tuned and tuned might mean that you've got the right, you know, packing blankets placed in the right place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be uh, the most expensive system, mm -hmm. but it has to be accurate. It has to translate. Translations never mattered more than now, but it means more that translation, not necessarily when you leave this room and put it in another room, translation from for your fold downs. So your physical system might sound great at a really loud volume. But your fold downs start to sound phasey or weird. You probably have a couple of things going wrong. But I would I would look at your room to begin with. Mm. Your room is messing with you. And if you're torquing already mixed, so let's say you, again, these are not productions that you've done soup to nuts like Ryan's record. This is yeah. maybe something you know. Like a lot of what I do is the Atmos mixes for either catalog previously released records that might be yeah. fifty years old. Or they may be, um, you know, new releases upcoming, and I've been, you know, asked to do the Atmos version. But essentially, I'm not being asked to reinvent the wheel. I'm being asked to be faithful to the intent of the artist, mixer, the whole team that made that record, that mix. And if if I find myself wanting to use even more than just the tiniest amount of EQ on any particular stem or or you know, uh, you know, track of audio, there's a problem to make it sound like the stereo mix you've got a problem something's gone wrong like those if they're well prepared multi-tracks or mix ready stems they should sound when in the 2.0 the stereo left right they should sound like they don't don't do anything until you get that those stems to sound like the stereo mix don't start playing with eq and and you know uh, reverbs that's or effects what, but that's one thing i want to ask you brad i mean like it's a it's a common endeavor in engineering, in stereo, that you got to make things fit, you know, because you it's 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 a box, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but the reality is, you got to do certain EQ curves and stuff like that. You got to bump other frequencies to get it to cut because things are kind of fighting themselves. So, in an immersive environment, and we had this discussion actually during Ryan's seminar with Michael, is that you start moving this stuff out and it starts exposing those extreme EQs, which when they have more space, um, you find yourself having to address that mm -hmm. because it just sounds really thin, but in the stereo version, it fits very nicely. 
the way it's EQ'd. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, since you're doing a lot of, you know, stereo mixes already recorded, you're just getting stems, and now you're moving it into an immersive mix, you were touching on it right there. And I just, if we can dig in it a little bit more, it's like, do you find yourself doing that? Because you were saying, oh, if I start EQing it too aggressively, then I'm changing it. But don't you kind of, in some ways, need to change it? Yes, but not aggressively. So uh, this is more, I, I would guess, akin to a mastering engineer's role with EQ. Okay. Where, again, if you're torquing in 10 db at 1k well you've got a problem <laughs> you know you should talk you should talk to you should talk to the producer or the mix engineer who sent this you know mangled mix to you like hey you know we we address this go back do a, a revise yeah, we're gonna mix. butcher it for you right right so i'm talking about yes i do eq almost every track almost every stem gets some eq but we're talking about a very soft cue or sometimes a very hard cue but a, a very soft amount of of almost always subtraction and and I'm, I'm my setup with my dad mom here, my controller. I have you can see here stereo. It says stereo and 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 Atmos, and and I'm toggling back and forth. My Pro Tools system has it set up, or I have the stereo reference, and I will go back and forth a hundred times. You know, like just over and over again. I might just go two bars in a loop to try to get this uh you know this guitar part that's coming that I really would like to place here because I like the way it feels to have it. You know. Mm -hmm or maybe in the rears, and I will work with that EQ, and I have a couple different kinds of EQ that I like to work with. They're not very specific. They're very broad stroke ones, oftentimes the 1073 UAD version, and I'll pull out oftentimes something around 300 hertz or 200 hertz, a half a dB, 2 dB might be all it needs, maybe a little bit of 3.2K or 4.7. I can't remember exactly where those uh, detents are. Mm -hmm. um i'm not uh it, that one seems to work a lot for me um i also use um i'm trying to emulate usually with mix ready stems um the mastering eq and, and compression that's been placed on the stereo mix so i'm trying to match that generally um but again like you said you're talking about taking sound that's confined to two speaker boxes two yeah. stereo speaker boxes and you're unchaining it and un uh, unleashing it into yeah. all these other environments other speaker you know locations um the need to brick wall the hell out of some of this modern rock stuff that i've mixed is lessened um it can still sound i mean that's and that's where the you know if there's any artistry uh, in this process of being an a successful atmos mixer it's in riding that balance between pure emulation of the stereo mix, which is what you're trying to achieve when you fold down to 2.0 and really taking advantage of these multi-speaker environments. Uh, and and also the places in between the speakers, um, whether it's you know pulled in from the center or the sides, you know, behind you, in front of you, or above you, or any any place that's not directly as in the in the in the bed which is like specific speaker locations. That's also problematic. And sometimes I'll say, well, I think I really like to hear this backing vocal coming out of here, this empty space in between my side and my rear. And I'll maybe pre-place it without even listening to it as I'm preparing, you know, many, many things. I'll just, I'm just guessing I'm going to want to hear it there as I'm listening to the stereo mix. I'm just setting my mix up. And then I actually listen to the Atmos version of it and where I've placed it doesn't sound good. Sometimes the where you want to put a sound just doesn't want to work, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you, you, you may want to have that green blob happening in that particular place, but if you can't, with a little bit of EQ, nudge it into the right place, you make it sound right, I have to, re I have to, I have to retreat and move to a specific sp set of speakers or closer to, uh, you know, the front of the stage, the LCR. Um, oh, is, is and, that what you're... Is, is that what you're confronting a lot, Brad, is that when you're dealing with an artist um, like Jeremy, for instance, that, look, you know, I want an enhanced version of the stereo mix in Atmos, as opposed to, well, look, I got 360 degrees here, you know, and I want to do this stereo mix completely differently. Do your clients tend to say, no, I, I still want it to sound like the stereo mix, but it's an Atmos mix. 
is that is that I, the expectation I, or i haven't mostly i, I i've come across uh, clients especially if they're people whose records i've already produced you know like like we've known each other and we've got a good relationship they're usually pretty much like go for it man i don't even know what you're doing i can't wait to come in and listen to what you've got cooking <laughs> and 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 you know it, again i'm i'm talking about my own you know tendency as a musician as a uh, you know for my whole life and as a record producer for the last for most of my adult life um uh and as a somebody who sat in you know audiences <laughs> stood there in bars you know clubs with a warm beer and watched a band i have a tendency to you know a fairly to be fairly conservative and then i pull things out it depends on again the, the format and um and the program material but a band like jeremy's which is a like a, a post hardcore band or a hardcore band that you know has two loud guitars distorted bass guitar drums and vocals that are mostly shouted sometimes sung there's uh, not a lot of elements going on there that aren't going full tilt. And um, and yet, Touche Mori is known for creating some of the most sort of dreamy uh, soundscapes in that genre. And and I'm proud to have been a part of some of that creation, you know, for a couple of their albums. This is one of them we're talking about. So when it came time for me to do an Atmos version of that album, um, I had more leeway. Bring so, um, but most of the time, most of the time, um, I'm, I'm not really... You know, I'm not, Unmuted. I think, I think uh, because I'm a musician already and I kind of know what I, you know, I've, I've been, been doing this a long time. I think that it's, you know, that's working in my favor. I'm not putting kick drums in the heights, you know, I'm not putting snare drums and toms or maybe yeah. I ought to, but I'm not. And maybe that's for a different generation to do. Um, uh, but I do place things in unusual places, but it's not going to be a lead vocal. <laughs> yeah. So if I understand you correctly, Brad, it varies. Sometimes you have some clients that kind of you want, they want the immersive mix to just sound like the stereo mix and others that give you the freedom to experiment. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, real quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the, the Pogues uh, Christmas classic fairy tale of New York that I, uh, I was asked to, to do an Atmos you know, stereo rebuild and then Atmos mix of in 2022. December 2022. It didn't come out till last December. Um, and that's got uh, Shane McGowan's lead vocal. It's got uh, Christy McCall's, uh, it's a duet. So she's an equal to his, you know, she sings her own verse. And when she duets with him, they're mixed equally. And it's, you know, engineered and mixed by the great Steve Lillywhite. So, um, and performed by these amazing musicians. And a lot of the world knows this song is one of their favorite or maybe their favorite Pogue songs. So mm -hmm. messing that one up is going to be tough, but it also includes a full string section, like an orchestral string wow. section. And so when we got the multi-tracks to work with, I hired Ken Sluter, my old pal, to do the stereo rebuilds. And he and Lily White and I had a couple of really great, you know, uh, you know, Zoom calls about that. That was hilarious and fun. And then James from the band was here in LA. and He came by to give his opinion about things as I was mixing it. Jem Finer in uh, London was also, you know, involved in this process and and had great notes. But my point was, we had an orchestra to play with, you know, <laughs> not, not a full orchestra, but a full string section, you know, like you know, sixty piece. And they did well, several pat. Well, might. Well, might. It's Lily White. Come on, man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't it's fuck all, around, right? It, yeah. yeah, no, he doesn't mess around at all. It, it's <laughs> Everything is beautifully recorded, and and so Jem Finer uh is a little more uh liberal in his uh ideas about what should happen he was like yeah you know i wouldn't worry mate too much about honoring this mix it was done with a lot of debate and i never really was you know super happy with it i mean it serves its purpose it's a good mix why don't we just go wild with it you know like okay great and then lily white's like i like this mix <laughs> <laughs> well that's good to hear and James Fernley is like, he's remembering when he wrote the string parts and arranged it and he wrote it this section, second section that comes in the, at the, at the, the back third, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the back quarter, 25% of the, of the song, which is this long outro instrumental. Um, and it's really beautiful. And they start to play this, uh, you know, B melody that he wrote and he'd love to have that nudged up a little bit, you know, because <laughs> he never thought it got quite loud enough. And, 
and somehow we hammered it out. But I was able to place things a little more ad adventurously because there were enough of the band members who were, in, you know, invested in the real time mixing of this, we, and the producer. Oh my God, you know, like his involvement was essential. And we also had a, a, essentially like a, an orchestral string, so I could treat it more like, you know, like well, let's let's have you just sort of plunk down in the middle of this string section. I have more than just a mono, you know, source. Yeah. I have. We had, I think, maybe eight tracks of of strings all, all around us, and so that final thing comes roaring out of the rears as if you're mm -hmm. the cello in you know in the orchestra, and all of a sudden you've got you know these guys are behind you, and if you've ever sat in an orchestra as a as a performer and had you know like the brass come in and take your back of your head off, it's it's amazing, you know, yeah. and so yeah, it's, it's awesome. a really it's a really satisfying mix, and I think that. Uh, for the most part, we pleased everyone involved. I think Jem might have uh, enjoyed it more, to be more adventurous. He would have preferred that. But hey, when you're in the Pogues, there's a lot of compromise going on. You know, it's a lot of members and a lot of alcohol. So, you know. <laughs> now, listen, anyway. I want to move on. I think we have Jeremy sure. online here. And Jeremy, okay. are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Hey. I hear you. Hey. hey. Hi, Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. No problem. It. Happy so to listen, be here. Um, listen, we want. I want to move on to the project, Brad, that you did with Jeremy. Can, can, can mm -hmm. you kind of uh, start the conversation on that, Brad? Okay. In a nutshell, 2013, Touche More uh, came to my studio to make what is now their album called uh, "Is Survived By," and we tracked and mixed it here, and. Um, it had a an, a strange uh, mix, uh, you know, portion. W would you agree with that, Jeremy? Uh, yeah, I would. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we recut most of Jeremy's vocals after I mixed a couple of the songs with the original vocal recordings, and it was um, we 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 decided to try tracking his vocals a specific way. And it turns out that that just didn't really work that well. So Jeremy was nice enough to come back into the studio and re-sing the vocals. And I re-recorded them more traditionally. And that really was the way forward. But somewhere along the line, it seems like that mix overall for the entire record, maybe because I'd gotten distracted with, uh, with correcting um, these vocal tracks, it never really quite had the power, and I think uh, that it should have had. And and I think both. I think it's safe to say that the band and myself were a little disappointed in the end with with where it sat when it came out. Um, and uh, so that was ten years ago. And for the tenth anniversary last year, the band asked me if I'd be interested in remixing it, and I said yes. So I did a remix, and Emily Lazar mastered it. And I think that I think we um, I think we made improvements. It was a rare opportunity to go back and revisit. Um, a record, you know, I think I'm speaking for myself, but I think probably a lot of producer mixers feel like they could do better almost like the minute that the record's been finished. You're like, wait, 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 wait. I need yeah, it. I yeah. to... <laughs> this is one of those rare moments where I was given uh, the opportunity to actually, you know, try to make it sound better. And I think that we did. But of course, now I'm in my Atmos mixing era. So I offered to do the Atmos version as well. And, uh, and so was it late December, I think, or either early January? I can't remember when it was, but uh, I did Atmos mixes of it and then invited Jeremy and other members of the band and Blaze, their manager, to come in and listen. And that's that's what yeah, we're here to hear. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Jeremy, I, I wanted to get your perspective because, you know, from what I understand here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is just that you, your frame of reference in your previous albums was stereo mixes, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, yeah. also just 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 because Brad uh, is good at being really self-deprecating, um, it's worth it's worth mentioning that we went to Brad again for the follow up record. So we weren't too disappointed. We obviously were like, we want to go back to Brad. Um, and but what was great about that experience was that we were able to say, OK, if that's what happened this last time, let's make sure this that doesn't happen again this time. And then when remixing this record, it was like, well, let's just try to make this first record with you sound like the one we did right after. And, and Brad, of course, knocked it out of the park. So give credit where credit's due. Um, 
And yes, I, uh, I mean, listening to you all talk about this, like I'm as I'm here to rep be representative of the layman where I'm like, this all sounds very interesting. <laughs> I, I don't know anything. Uh, all I know is that when I went and had the pleasure of sitting with Brad, uh, with my band members and sitting in that chair and hearing what Atmos actually is in that environment, it, it, uh, it's undeniably incredible and, and a real, a real treat for anybody to get to have that happen for their records. So no, that's great. Um, that's great. You know, a, yeah. a, a big, you know, I saw something. I don't know if it was Mix Magazine or something like that. There was an engineer um, that set who does Atmos mixing and stuff, and he was saying that you know, ten years from now, um, you know, nobody's going to do stereo mixing anymore. It's just, it's just going to be immersive. You know, whether it's three Sony 360 or Dolby Atmos mixes, you know, just like stereo replaced mono, you know, immersive, you know, is going to replace stereo. And I don't know if I entirely agree with that. And I'm and and I and I'm pointing this question at you, Jeremy. You know, you, you know your stereo mixes, you know, and yeah. the one thing I just speaking for myself, you know. I like, particularly when the music's aggressive. And by the way, I love your music, man. I, you know, I just spent the weekend Thank you. just checking it out. It's great. Great energy, Thank great you. stuff. Um, but I like the visceral, like with aggressive music, that 2D, like things are fighting for attention. What, 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 what happened there? Mute him. Are, are, you, are you there, Jeremy? Yeah, I'm here. All right, cool. Anyway, I don't know what happened there. But anyway, um, the, um, hold up. So the thing I wanted to ask you is that you listen to Brad's immersive mixes that he's done. You still have the reference to the stereo. Do you still like yeah. both? Do you, do you still kind of go, hey, man, I, I love the stereo version. And you know what? I love the immersive version, too. I mean. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm a big I'm a big movie fan. And I think that it, a comparison I can make is like, you know, uh, I like a lot of people wanted him to invest in a nice uh, surround sound system for my television when I'm home because I can't go to the theater anymore. So now I want something nice for the home. I think it's something kind of similar like that, where like, you know, there's there's how you expect to hear a movie when you're on the big screen or or, you know, in the theater or when you're just watching it at a friend's house or something like that. But if you have the opportunity to hear it in a different capacity where it sounds really excellent and you get this totally like, wow, I can hear that behind me. I can hear yeah. that here. Um, you know, I think that there's something uh, special about both of those circumstances. Like, I, I you know, it, I feel like it's too, it might be too soon for me to be like, yes, we should absolutely replace stereo immediately. Um, <laughs> I think right now it just, it just feels like a really, uh exciting endeavor you know i think that i'm sure it's been a topic of conversation here but it's like i think people's homes home stereo or like how they listen to things might need to be updated along with you know so the change can not happen dramatically i think it's going to be a thing that'll probably happen over time but it would be incredible if everybody could have a nice dolby atmos system in their house well, sure. you know ideally yeah yeah and prices are gradually coming down for people to acquire those systems so you you find the stereo mix and the immersive mix as aggressive, equally so. Would you say that? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, with the kind of band we are, where there is a lot of melody going on that I'm just kind of ruining by yelling on top of it. Um, <laughs> it's not, it was like exciting to be like, okay, yeah, like I can hear these really pretty guitars that, you know, my guitar player did. Uh, on this left side, while you know over here, uh, the rhythm section is is consistently going. You know, like Brad was really cool, was really good at like kind of placing um, where specific things needed to shine, and uh, you know him being so involved in that project, obviously, like I think he, you know, had all, had all the right ideas there. So it was again just me sure. going and having a having a vague idea of what Dolby Atmos was. And then getting to experience that. And then afterwards, Brad showed us, I know, the famous like Elton John song, which was like, okay, yeah, this is pretty special. That's sweet. And Brad, I the just want to just bounce that question to you briefly is, you know, 
do you see 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, like immersive completely replacing stereo? I think that we're going to see live performance spaces be, um, be immersive. And I think that that's going to be uh, everywhere from clubs to, you know, spheres like the MSG yeah. sphere and yeah. everything in between. I think that that's going to become in 10 years. And my guess is that's going to be pretty commonplace. And um, just like any live venue is right now, there's, uh, there's always those places that have the worst possible sound and uh, they always sound crappy, whether it's a, a rock band or, you know, like, like an EDM club and there's gonna be these places that are top notch, but, Overall, it seems like the level of playback in in live performance spaces has gotten better, especially over the last ten years. And I imagine that with I, th I think I imagine that that's going to happen with immersive um, over the next over the next ten years. And I think that the audiences will start to expect to hear that in mm -hmm. their cars. And so, personally, I think that. Um, if this initiative to you know really get people to to listen and accept um atmos or any other kind of immersive technology if it really does take hold and and the reason the way it will take hold in my mind is going to be the way that it did for jeremy or me or you or anyone it's going to be when you actually sit there and hear it talking about it is really frustrating and doesn't really help it's a little bit like dancing about architecture so um uh, I think that in 10 years, everyone will deliver, my guess, is, uh, you know, an immersive mix that also folds down to stereo because we still will have millions and millions of people who are just listening to stereo or prefer it. And uh, I think it'll just be uh, immersive will be the format that everyone mixes to unless you really don't want to use it. And then you're just doing stereo and and your, you know, your product will not be immersified. And But I think that it's going to be uh, commonplace and every day for us mixing engineers. Interesting. You know, um, did you have some Wait, is there, has there been conversation about like, if like, is there going to be a way that they'll be able to do this into physical format or is this just strictly going to be a digital thing? Say that again. Is there going to be, has there been conversation about like, I, you know, I obviously like I'm a big vinyl guy. Like, is there, has there been conversations about, ways that they're going to make like a physical copy of a way to have this be expanded into like a Dolby Atmos thing for vi like uh, vinyl, for example. I don't know that answer, but, um, but maybe somebody else uh, here does. Like Ben, is he, ben, he's still with us? No, I got it. I'm cool. Yeah. I, I was trying to bring up the chat chat room because soon we have to start ad addressing some of these oh, questions. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I, 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 what Jeremy just said, I apologize, Jeremy. But oh, you're fine. I was having technical difficulties. Oh, I, I couldn't hear what you were saying anyway. So, um, um, so the question was, is there a future where physical media can be purchased? I know Jeremy's a big vinyl collector, like yeah, massive. Yeah. Well, is I there going to be... There. I can, yeah. I can jump on an answer and I can't speak to roadmap. That would be incredible. I'm a big vinyl collector myself, but what we are yeah. seeing is people doing their Dolby Atmos mix first, deriving their stereo mix from that. So you could be working with a higher resolution master from the beginning, taking that stereo, pressing that version onto vinyl. Of okay. course, of course, you know, results may vary that way on how immersive that, that really is depending on your playback system, but you could sure, also... Yeah you know, certainly experience um, Dolby Atmos on physical formats such as Blu-ray, which have been available for, for a long time. Totally, before. yeah. Right. That is a, a very interesting concept and one that I've pondered many times myself. Yeah. Is there any I chance? Mean, as, as we all know, the, I'm sure the vinyl industry would be like, wait, we get to repress every single thing again? Right? <laughs> I mean, I mean it, it's, you know, like if you're talking about miniaturizing a stylus that has, or a, a multi- a multi stylus, you know, um, a multi, uh, uh, oh, what am I trying to say? Like a bunch of little diamonds, you know, uh, manufacturers. Needles, yeah, sure. That, you know, and, and, and I know they did it for quad. Um, maybe there's a way to do that and you know, then, then watch out, you know, <laughs> who knows what'll happen. I, yeah. I, you know, all right. So, look, I want to, I want to try to address actually some of these questions are being pointed to you, Jeremy. 
Um, okay. So, let me see. All right, Pas Pascal. Um, I'd love to hear Jeremy's thoughts on the binaural translation and if it works for him in comparison to listening to the actual Atmos mix at Brad's studio. In other words, when you when you hear the immersive mix of your music on headphones or your your, your AirPods, what what what's your opinion? Is it is it dramatically different than in Brad's studio when you heard it through a speaker system? I think it felt I, I felt the impact much more being present in Brad's studio. I will say that. I, I don't I don't know that I was able to tell as much of a difference. Maybe it just could have been my AirPods maybe not being the right one. I don't, I, you know, like it didn't, I remember just listening and being like, yeah, this sounds great. This sounds super cool. But obviously being sitting in a chair with all of the different speakers was something that's, that really felt different, you know? Intense, actually. Yeah. 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 That's how I feel. I mean, I like the binaural. I really do. But, God, you know, when you're in an Atmos facility and you listen to it, or a theater for that matter, you know, um, it's it's like wow, dramatically different. Um, yeah, I do also. I do also got to say, like, I think the genre of music we're playing, as like Brad was kind of pointing out, with it, like, kind of being pretty full on a lot of the times. Like, I also imagine if you know, if we it sounded like Sam Cook, I probably would have been like, oh yeah, like I could hear all the different <laughs> things happening. But uh, but sadly, it's me barking most of the time, and that's uh, <laughs> that might change things. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to find uh, another question here. Just hang in there with me. It's it's my monitor is like I'm feeling my age, Brad, at fifty. Uh, I mean, it's like this like font size eight, you know, that I'm like, yeah, really, you know. So I apologize for the for the gap here, but give me a no second. Problem. Sure. Um, I mean, this is got, I, I literally could, I got, I got my, I got the questions right here on this right hand side. I mean, Brian asked Brad, uh, what is your signal flow for monitoring? Thank Apple you. Music I was just going to read that. <laughs> yeah. Wait, say that I, I missed that. What was that, Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah. Brad, what is your signal flow for monitoring Apple music Atmos albums into your PMC system? Um, Okay, so I have a, my computer is a um, Mac Studio, circa 2022, and I um, I play Apple Music, uh, you know, Atmos via uh, audio movers. Um, it's a software, third-party software, uh, standalone. It's up in my menu here. Let me take a look. And I, um, through, through uh, uh, Dante, the Dante network, I assign in the Dadman software, um uh th those channels so that it streams um through my system so uh everything passes through the dadman software which uh licensed by avid from digital audio denmark i hope that answers your question so uh, i essentially i paid for audio movers just so i could have uh you know that implementation mm, i think with the latest os you might not need that anymore but I'm not on the latest OS. I'm on Ventura and Ventura might do it too. I don't know. I just upgraded my OS on Saturday. I'm really slow at making those changes because, um, because I need to have a system that doesn't ever crash. So I don't, I rarely go with the latest. So you may not even need audio movers, uh, but you do, but it is via Dante and virtual sound card. Um, uh, I use that as well. Um, it gets confusing fast, but so far it's worked really well. Hope that answers your question. Um, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, are you moderating now? Yeah, I'll just yeah, I'll set up. Listen, here we go. Fine, I'm, I got, I'm still I trying this, to read this goddamn. Let's, I got you. I got you, Mark. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dave asked a couple of questions. Um, Dave asked, hey, Brad, is there a playlist of your Atmos mixes available? Have you made one? I have not. Uh, I'm not a public facing one on Apple Music. Um, I should and I will because um, that would great be great cool. idea. There's there's a lot of hundreds. There's I've done a lot of albums, so um, I have a. Um, I'm going to write this down. 
playlist. Yeah, I will make one. You know, that means I got to learn how to do that. Uh, I have my own playlist, but um, they're filled with all kinds of strange things. Um, I, I've worked on a lot of stuff, so I should put one together and I'll talk to somebody who can help this old man figure that out. Uh, ask, no, ask one of your kids. I'm sure they could knock that out for you. <laughs> what are you Mark, what were you going to say? Um, I'm, I'm actually going to continue on with Dave's line of questioning, but it's kind of um, broad in a way. But okay. are there any specific plugins, tools you find hard to work in Atmos? Like mm. things that you've used in stereo, but now when it's in Atmos, it's like, yeah, I can't really use that anymore because I'm doing that's a really, things. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't use a lot of plugins in Atmos. Um, I usually use a compressor or a limiter uh, to help emulate the stereo mastering that was applied to the original stereo ref uh, reference. Um, and I use a little bit of EQ. And then I use a, a handful of reverbs, um, and they're almost always Altiverb um, by, or not Salamone, uh, I forget who makes no, Altiverb, that's all I need to know. And uh, Sound Tools, um, uh, a couple of uh, their um, delay effects. Um, but as far as like um, ones that don't translate, um, uh, that that's, uh, you, you know, I don't, I don't want to name it. I don't, you know, some of these companies are great, but some stuff, like some of the reverbs don't translate well. I find that spring reverb uh, convolution, you know, like uh, IRs don't work very well. Some reason, there's something about that to my ears. It seems like um, room emulations work better. So uh, emulations of, uh, of like digital reverbs, you know, like a Lexicon 40L, I find that those don't really work for me very well. I tend to to gravitate more in Atmos to um, uh, uh, to actual room emulations, you, right? Do you, you, um, do you use Nugent Halo? Is that part of your arsenal? I I do sometimes. I mean, that's um that so Nugent Halo is like an upmix plugin, right? Yeah, exactly. And to kind of get so something to take it'll, it, it, it can it, yes, it can immersify something that is uh, you know mono Just, or stereo. Yeah, yeah. I, I almost never use it. I do use it, and it's really useful. But I only use that in instances where I might not have access to uh, stems or multitracks. Yeah, I got a message from Ben um, from Dolby. Uh, I think he was asking what plugins you find hard to work without in Atmos. And he capitalized it like oh, telling me, oh, you, know, you really screwed oh. up here. <laughs> and I've been oh, okay. botching names. I've been botching names too. All, all oh, no, no worries. Okay, well, to answer that question, it's almost the same answer. <laughs> I mean, I really like Altiverb a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, the U UAD plugins are particularly good for their EQs. Um, I, 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 I really like the sound of Neve stuff. Uh, the um, DSP uh, EQs are really good. If I want to get into some specific, usually subtractive EQ, you know, where I'm pulling out a frequency. And then um, Soothe 2 is also really good. If I've got a problematic um, frequency, that's something that's ringing a little, you know, resonating a little bit too much. It might have been fine for the stereo mix, but in Atmos, it's now lying there naked and complaining. So Soothe 2 is also quite excellent. Um, I would find it hard to to do a, 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 a to mix an album in Atmos without those plugins specifically. Oh, Dolby Atmos Panner. The Panner is great. Um, I really like that a lot. Yeah, you know, I do too. You know, I mean, I, I, the the Pro Tools Panner is, is cool, yep, but yep. I really dig that you can just get an object and just have a, a built-in um, automation where, hey man, I just want this thing to like circle around you know, at a yep. certain certain beat and pace and cadence with the music. Oh my God, you you know the amount of programming that saves. Uh, I know, yeah. That so that's that's pretty essential. That comes that comes with yeah. the. But if you're going to be mixing in, in Atmos, in Pro Tools, you're going to be using Dolby's products, and you get that along with it. So it not only is essential, it's it's, you know, it's um, 
it's part of the package. Gotcha. So listen, um, we don't have much time left, and now's an okay. excellent time to give us an impromptu tour of your studio. <laughs> Can we all right, great. Yeah, Is yeah, you? yeah. And listen, um, I apologize, people, if I didn't get to all your questions. You know, I apologize for that. Yeah, you can always ask me questions via DM on Instagram, too, if you follow me on Instagram, which is really the only social media that I, I trifle with these days. If you That's send cool. me a, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll and you know what I'll there. do is actually, Brad, I'll bug you and I'll, I'll go after this is done <laughs> tomorrow. I'll just forward you a bunch of questions. Okay. You know, to that's fine. People. Yeah. Mark, you've been bugging me for months. So, you know, don't. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm good sure. at it. I'm good. Oh, at yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to try to do this little tour here. Um, do you guys, uh, do you guys, I, I've had the pleasure of seeing this wonderful studio. I actually have to run. Uh, so okay. uh, thank Jeremy, you for having thank me. Thank you, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank and you yeah, so much. Brad, Brad Wood forever. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Jeremy. Take care. Take care. Love you too, buddy. Bye-bye. All right. Let me go over here. I'm going to turn myself around. Can you still hear me? I sure do. Okay. So this is my recording studio. It's called Seagrass. I built it 20 years ago. And we opened literally 20 years ago this month. Um, and uh, since this is an Atmos uh demonstration you know let's focus on that i've got a 914 9.1.4 which is nine speakers facing your face you know basically ear eye level and these are pmcs that's my lcr those are the uh pmc 228 those are self-powered speakers um these are the uh pmc wafer ones i think and i've got one two that's a that's a wide left and wide right and you've got sides um which is basically right where your listening position is so right pointing at your your ears those are my rears and then i've got four of the wafer twos uh, that's the point four the last number in the 914 and those are mounted to my ceiling um i also have a subwoofer that's the one the 9.1 that is a massive subwoofer that um <laughs> it's upside down and side firing, meaning that it's meant to be this and facing forward, but instead it's facing this way, shooting off to the to to my right. And the reason it's doing that is because when Dolby came here to calibrate and tune the room, they found that there was a buildup of some frequencies. I think 62 hertz were really building up, and when we experimented with placing this woofer in different um, positions. And I think the feeling was that is bouncing off of the sound is bouncing up here and just causing a bunch of havoc down below. So problem was solved by turning it upside down and side firing it. Um, uh, are you still with me? I'm with you, man. Okay, good. So these are my LEA amplifiers. Uh, those power, those three uh, amplifiers in that rack, in that little alcove, power all the surrounds and the LFE, which is the subwoofer. Mm. These three are, are self-powered. They have their own amplifiers. Uh, see my system here. I've just got a, you know, just a big LG screen, a smaller screen that I like a little bit closer to my face, sort of like a laptop that usually has the renderer. Um, uh, and uh, an iPad, which also has dad man information and, um, though the, the, the uh, LEA online link to <clears throat> these speakers so I can monitor what's going on with these speakers um, and keep track of that. I don't use any EQ that LEA provides or any timing, although they do have that. If you, um, you know, if you want to do your calibration that way, I use the Dadman software, which is part of the DAD and Avid um interfaces so i've got a matrix studio which is above the big blue dad yeah. um, core core 256 and i got a bunch of audio stuff compressors and things for stereo for record production that's not even turned on and none of those are turned on why have them on if you're not using them for the moment sure. you know next month they'll all be on <laughs> and i'll be mixing in stereo um there's my vinyl back there uh what else do you need to see Turntable because, you know, I listen to vinyl almost every day. Um, there's a really great 
tape delay by this company called Echofix out of Australia that make uh, uh, a, a Roland style tape delay, which is just amazing. Um, synthesizers, tons and tons of guitar pedals because I record a lot of guitars, a bunch of guitars, artwork, couch. <laughs> um, let me see real quickly. I'll show you the bathroom because this is funny. I keep my I, I I keep my platinum and gold awards here because that's what every record producer in Los Angeles does. They put them in the bathroom. False <laughs> modest false modesty wins. All right, I'm going to take you guys out to the studio real quick. The tracking room is actually in that building there. And are the, uh, are the helicopters still up? No, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice and quiet now. So that's uh that's the entrance. Big beefy doors because sound isolation is really important. And here's my tracking room. Um, this doesn't really have anything to do with Atmos, but uh, oh, it's, it's but great. It, but it is what you know I do for a living. So 20 years here, floated floors, suspended walls and ceiling, um, lots and lots of isolation. This is the I think it's the 14th room tracking room I built since 1988. So I'm getting better at it every time I do it. And um, some Brad, of these rooms, are, they're still open. Yeah, go ahead. Brian, quick question. Did you tune your recording room like you did your studio? Nope. <laughs> I just, I had a garage that I converted to a tracking room and I wanted it to be as big as possible, which is why I've got an alcove here. Um, I've built a lot of rooms and I don't really like bass trapping for smaller rooms. And I don't really like bass trapping for big rooms, to be honest. I think that they it sounds funny to my ears. I like, for drums, I like a room that reacts really pretty dramatically. So these are parallel walls and and, and ceiling and floor, but I don't hate, I, I, I don't like flutter echoes. So um, mm. it's not a very live room, but my absorption is placed so that there are no flutter echoes. And so you can see how these spaces are are different than these. So mm. there's... These are narrower here. Any place there's absorption, there's going to be a reflection. There's no, there, there's yeah, there's no place where there's bare wall facing bare wall. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's that's by design. I just trial and error over the years, and there's plenty of white papers telling you the same thing. So <laughs> join AES people, you'll be better for having done it. Well, anyway, band plays out here. I've tracked almost every record I've made in the last twenty years here, including. The Touche Amore stuff. Sometimes I'll book a studio somewhere else if the band needs me to come to where they are. But I've mixed every record since 2004 um, in that little room. Brad, so uh, do you still, because, um, you know, there are people out there that still do this. Do, do you mm -hmm. uh, ever do projects where you record to reel to reel? No, I haven't used analog to track since 2003 got it got it i was just curious I'm switching to, yeah cool. i'm no i'm no i'm not really interested in that anymore i uh i i i battled analog tape my whole career i'm i really You're don't like the noise it. floor You're done with it <laughs> I, oh yeah I, I was done with it before i even got started i mean to be honest and i've owned a lot of tape machines i um if you like it that's great there's a lot of people that like all kinds of things and I don't, you know, I don't share, I don't share the enthusiasm that they do for those particular things, whether it's music or food or cars or fashion. Um, I think for long-term storage, I think there was a lot of concern about tape being better than digital, but um, now we're getting three, almost four decades into long-term digital storage. To, we've gotten better at it, but that's still an issue. Um, and I think that might be the only place where I think, for me at least, tape might win for long-term storage. But as far as a um, accurate form of recording, it uh, it's not good. I don't like the way it sounds. I, I what I like is hearing the audio coming out of my speakers. I've placed a microphone, I put it through a preamp, and I've EQ'd it or whatever, and I'm listening to a drum kit playing or a kick drum. And when I send it to a tape machine, I don't care what kind of tape machine it is, it comes back sounding different. And whether it's better or whether it's worse, it's still different. Yeah. And it, and I don't like having, I've never liked it. I've never liked it. I've owned a lot of great tape machines and even the best still make things sound different. And I'm tired. Even I got tired. 
Yeah. Even back in the digital age where it was 16 bit, you you, mm. you still prefer. No, I did. No, no. I mean, I'm not saying that I went digital instantly. I went digital when it started to my ears sounding better or yeah, equal. Yeah, 24 bit. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I I yeah. I absolutely had no interest in um, ADAT or um, oh gosh, what was the other format? Um, Oh, uh, um, task camp. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, ugh, terrible. And I also really never warmed up to the Sony 3348s. I think I think that was just ripping people off. Yeah. <laughs> the the HR version almost started to sound as good as my uh, Apogee 88000s with a you know with a mm. uh, with a Quadra 850. I'm I'm I'll go to I'll go to the mat for that. I I I wasn't a fan of digital audio until I was. And then yeah. I eventually, as a studio owner, I saw the benefits of of leaving these uh, tape machines behind. I also, to be really frank, and I'll get off of this whole thing, analog tape supply in the 80s uh, was great, but by the mid 90s, it was ridiculous. You know, mm -hmm. Agfa going out of business and problems with who's owning, you know, all the yeah, different impacts. You know, impacts. Oh, yeah. And then coming, and they were coming up with Sony or not Sony, um, 3M was coming up different. They're all coming up with different formulations to try to, you know, to keep us interested and to make improvements. They're trying to evolve it, but tape formulations that would cause a lot of shed, you know, would separate from the mylar or would be cut too wide. So it didn't fit through your guides, um, you know, without curling and purling on the sides. It, 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 that really bugged me, you know, where, you know, I'd have a whole batch of 456 that, was so thin i could see through it you know <laughs> like i got to send all these reels back like who is making this stuff this stuff's not growing on trees it's being manufactured by companies who are being sold and resold and resold yeah. to bigger corporations that are all looking down yeah. Uh, yeah. i hated it i hated it and i think that that's to be honest amongst the people <laughs> who are real real fans of analog to this day that's a story that is untold and i think that as studio as a studio owner from decades and decades that's a story that every studio owner understands this stuff is problematic and it's even more problematic now than ever as far as tape stock and availability so and i'll All get right. off my soapbox yeah no man got it sorry okay. for taking you there man <laughs> no no no, 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 no. Man, you know <laughs> our therapy session went awry <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. I, <laughs> anyway, I, I, yeah. yeah no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Say it. Go ahead. You were gonna say. Oh, something? I was gonna. I, I was just gonna say that. Um, you know, you can record a great record on any format. You know, that's um, that's just the truth. It, whether it's a laptop or a four track cassette or uh, you know, a bunch of ADATs, You know, um, or the best tape machines the the money can buy. Um, a lot of great records get made on those formats and I'll, and some really bad records get made on those formats. Yeah, sure. It really, it really is up to, you know, it's really up to you as the end user, you know, um, whether you're going to make those things sound good. So my earliest recordings are some of the ones that people know best. And those were made with a cobbled together group of strange analog with strange tape, you know, noise reduction and, um, and simply, you know, you know, a Fostex 4030 and a 4035. So I could put two 16 track machines together to get 30 tracks. Um, oddball stuff, you know, and, yeah. and the records. With synchronizers and stuff. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, you know, you use what you have and use what works for you. Um, yeah. But never believe anybody who's telling you this is the absolute best way and everything else is bad. Yeah. That's usually a, that's a red flag for me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brad, li th li listen, I want to thank you so much. Sorry I botched a bunch of names, people. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry about that. <laughs> Apparently, I'm really good at that, too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Brad, wealth of information, man. I won't bug you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks again for inviting me, and thanks to Ben and, uh, and, and Jeremy. Um, you know, and Chip for uh, for helping pull all this together. So, um, yeah. and Mark, of course, for making it all happen and inviting me. I, I've, yeah. I've, I've enjoyed doing it. I wish I had an extra hour. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben, I apologize to you botching your name as well. So don't hold it against me. 
Um, I, I wouldn't do so, Mark. I'm, I'm well used to it, and you got closer than most, sir. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I feel better now. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So, look, good night, people. Take care of yourselves. Good night. And, and again, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care, Brad. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Brad.